Welcome to Old Treasures Made New, your devotional podcast on the go or at home, where we read the scriptures and reflect on them with those from the past. Today we'll be reading Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 34, and then through J.C. Ryle's expository thoughts on Mark. Please take a moment to pause and to ask the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and to apply what we hear. Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 34. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick and oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. This is the word of the Lord. These verses begin with a long list of miracles which Mark's gospel contains. They tell us how our Lord cast out devils in Capernaum and healed Peter's wife's mother of a fever. We learn in the first place from these verses the uselessness of a mere intellectual knowledge of religion. Twice we are specifically told that the unclean spirits know our Lord. In one place it says, they knew him. To another, the devil cries out, I know you who you are, the Holy One of God. They knew Christ when scribes were ignorant of him and Pharisees would not acknowledge him, and yet their knowledge was not unto salvation. The mere belief of the facts and doctrines of Christianity will never save our souls. Such belief is no better than the belief of devils. They all believe and know that Jesus is the Christ. They believe that he will one day judge the world and cast them down into endless torment in hell. It is a solemn and sorrowful thought that on these points some professing Christians have even less faith than the devil. There are some who doubt the reality of hell and the eternity of punishment. Such doubts as these find no place except in the hearts of self-willed men and women. There is no infidelity among devils. They believe and tremble. James 2.19 Let us take heed that our faith be a faith of the heart as well as of the head. Let us see that our knowledge has a sanctifying influence on our affections and our lives. Let us not only know Christ, but love him from a sense of actual benefit received from him. Let us not only believe that he is the Son of God and the Savior of the world, but rejoice in him and cleave to him with purpose of heart. Let us not only be acquainted with him by the hearing of the ear, but by daily personal application to him for mercy and grace. The life of Christianity, says Luther, consists in possessive pronouns. It is one thing to say, Christ is a Savior, It is quite another to say, he is my Savior and my Lord. The devil can say the first. The true Christian alone can say the second. We learn in the second place to what remedy a Christian ought to resort first in times of trouble. He ought to follow the example of the friends of Simon's mother-in-law. We read that when she lay sick with fever, They told Jesus about her. There is no remedy like this. Means are to be used diligently, without question, 
in any time of need. Doctors are to be sent for in sickness. Lawyers are to be consulted when property or character needs defense. The help of friends is to be sought. But still, after all, the first thing to be done is to cry to the Lord Jesus Christ for help. None can relieve us so effectually as he can. None is so compassionate and is so willing to relieve. When Jacob was in trouble, he turned to his God first. Deliver me, I beg you, from the hand of Esau, Genesis 32.11. When Hezekiah was in trouble, he first spread Sennacherib's letter before the Lord. Save us, please, from his hand, 2 Kings 19.19. 19. When Lazarus fell sick, his sisters sent immediately to Jesus. Lord, they said, he whom you love is sick, John 11.2. Now let us do likewise. Cast your burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain you, Psalm 55.22. Casting all your cares upon him, 1 Peter 5.7. In everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Philippians 4, 6. Let us not only remember this rule, but practice it too. We live in a world of sin and sorrow. The days of darkness in a man's life are many. It needs no prophet's eye to foresee that we shall all shed many tears and feel many heart wrenchings before we die. Let us be armed with a formula against despair before our troubles come. Let us know what to do when sickness or bereavement or cross or loss or disappointment breaks in upon us like an armed man. Let us do as they did in Simon's house at Capernaum. Let us at once tell Jesus. We learn in the last place from these verses what a complete and perfect cure the Lord Jesus makes when he heals. He takes the sick woman by the hand and lifts her up and immediately the fever left her. But this was not all. A greater miracle remained behind. At once, we are told, she ministered unto them. That weakness and prostration of strength, which, as a general rule, a fever leaves behind it, in her case, was entirely removed. The fevered woman was not only made well in a moment, but in the same moment made strong and able to work. We may say in this case a lively emblem of Christ's dealing with sin-sick souls. That blessed Savior not only gives mercy and forgiveness, he gives renewed grace besides. To as many as receive him as their physician, he gives power to become the sons of God. He cleanses them by his Spirit when he washes them with his precious blood. Those whom he justifies, he also sanctifies. When he bestows an absolution, he also bestows a new heart. When he grants free forgiveness for the past, he also grants strength to minister to him for the time to come. The sin-sick soul is not merely cured and then left to itself. It is also supplied with a new heart and a right spirit and enabled so to live as to please God. There is comfort in this thought for all who feel a desire to serve Christ, but at present are afraid to begin. There are many in this state of mind. They fear that if they come forward boldly and take up the cross, they shall eventually fall away. They fear that they shall no longer be able to persevere and shall bring discredit on their profession. Let them fear no longer. Let them know that Jesus is an almighty Savior who never forsakes those who once commit themselves to him. Once raised by his mighty hand from the death of sin and washed in his precious blood, they go on serving him to their life's end. They shall have power to overcome the world and crucify the flesh and resist the devil. Only let them begin, and they shall go on. Jesus knows nothing of half-cured cases and half-finished work. Let them trust in Jesus and go forward. The pardoned soul shall always be enabled to serve Christ. There is comfort here for all who are really serving Christ and are yet cast down by a sense of their own infirmity. There are many in such cases. They are oppressed by doubts and anxieties. They sometimes think they shall never reach heaven after all, but be cast away in the wilderness. Let them fear no longer. Their strength shall be according to their day. 
The difficulties they now fear shall vanish out of their path. The lion in the way which they now dread shall prove to be chained. The same gracious hand which first touched and healed shall uphold, strengthen, and lead them to the last. The Lord Jesus will never lose one of his sheep. Those whom he loves and pardons, he loves to the end. Though sometimes cast down, they shall never be cast away. The healed soul shall always go on serving the Lord. Grace shall always lead to glory. That is the end of Ryle's expository thoughts for these verses. Let us carefully consider what we have heard today. May the Lord be pleased to bring the growth for His glory. In considering what we've just heard, would you prayerfully ask yourself and others the following questions? Is what we know about God and His gospel changing us? Do we know things about Christ, or do we love the one we know? Do we believe Jesus is the Son of God? Or do we rejoice and cling to him as well? Do we daily come to him for grace? Second, do we have it as an established rule that the first thing I must do when trials come my way is to tell Jesus first? What we go to first is telling of what our confidence is in. And third, are we giving ourselves by the strength that God supplies to good works? and serving.